Here we go. Good morning. Um, my name's Garrett. I've been in student ministry here at this church for almost three years. And I got to let you guys know a little secret about student ministry. There is this thing that high schoolers have where they will talk about phrases and words in ways that, that we have to learn on the fly about what these words are. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you in on one of these. One of the more recent ones, and it probably is already faded out now. It's probably already done away with. But it's this, this, this word cap, okay? Now the word cap, it's not a hat. It's not something that you put on your head. No, no, no. This word cap means that's a lie. That ain't true. That's, that's, not, that's cap. Okay, so hang with me, hang with me. And then the opposite would be the, the no cap, right? So we understand what, so if I were to say, LeBron James is the greatest basketball player of all time, you guys would say, that's cap. Yeah, that's cap, that's cap. Okay, you guys, you guys are catching on, you guys are catching on. So we have this thing where we have to figure out, man, are we gonna be influenced by these? Are we gonna start saying cap and no cap or are we gonna create our own thing? So me and Jay, Jay and I, however the right way to say that is, we have created our own system and we are now the ones that try to influence the students. So I'm gonna let you in on one of these. We will say, that's baller, that's baller. Now you may think, what does that mean? When we say something is baller, that means it's, it's really good. Like that, that was baller, like that was a great, and if it's really, really good, if it's, should we say great, then we will say that was Baller City. We throw a little city on the end of it. Yeah, I'm telling you, we do. So then when we have our students start to say that's Baller, then we're like, oh yeah, yep, you guys, you're in our court now. We got you. We got you right where we want you. And so we love this little battle that we play with the students. We love this battle of influence, battle of vocabulary. And uh, I think this little battle, this idea of battle, is why a lot of us love sports, right? We have these, these two, two people, two teams, and they're going after the same thing, and we don't really know what the outcome will be, right? There's this mystery, there's this anticipation, and games almost unfold like a story. And I've met many people, though, that are not a fan of sports. They don't like sports, but stories. I have yet to meet someone who doesn't like a good story, and many of you have probably figured this out, but if you ever wanna get someone's attention, you just start telling them a story. If you went to the zoo, don't just say that you went to the zoo, draw them in, tell them a story. If I said, man, when I was 13, went to the Omaha Zoo, it's fun, saw some animals, put on some sunscreen, <laughs> went back in the car, drove two hours home, it was a great time. Do you wanna go to the Omaha Zoo after that? No, that sounds terrible. But if I said, hey, listen, a while ago, a long time ago, I was 13, went to the Omaha Zoo and there's this really big building. It's like an indoor rainforest. Think of Iowa humidity, except in this whole place. Iowa summer humidity in this whole place. It's three stories big, so it's a really big building. And you've got snakes, you've got monkeys, you've got the koalas, they're really cute. And then they have these parrots, okay? And I don't know whose idea it was to let these birds free roam around this place, but they were free roaming around the place. And so here I am, third floor, thankfully they had a railing set up so we weren't just falling off. And I'm kind of just eyeing the place, palm trees, there's things everywhere. I'm just walking along and all of a sudden, my hand runs into the moistest, mushiest thing. And I look and it was bird poop all over. So right, 13 year old guy, I gotta stay tough, gotta stay calm. So I did what any teenager boy would do. I run up to my mom and I'm like, mom, high five. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that last part. I didn't do that. My mom's here though. She, she would have remembered and that would not have been good for me. Um, so you guys know though, like that is the power of a story, right? That's the power of a story. And this morning I want us to tap, I want to tap into that love that we all have for a good story. So you see, normally on a Sunday, we'd spend time in a specific chapter, a specific set of verses, but today we're gonna to be looking kind of this 30,000 foot view, this flyover approach to, to, to this story, to this story. So if you have one of these with you, or if you have it on your phones, we're gonna, we're gonna be in two places pretty quickly. One will be Ezekiel chapter 28. The other will be Genesis 3. And so as you find your way there now, um, they go ahead and do that, but we're gonna be talking about stories for just a minute more. You see, one indisputable characteristic of stories is the, is the plot. And our attention is, is hooked once we catch a hint of conflict. You know, when something isn't quite right, we just wanna read or see more. Like we gotta figure out how this thing will resolve itself. And many stories, they do this by having the good guys and the bad guys, right? The superheroes and the villains the characters with the good motives and the characters with the bad. And I want us to think about it this way. 
Like would Batman really be Batman without Bane or without the Joker, without the bad guy? You see, part of what makes us love Batman is how good the villain is. And if a movie has a terrible bad guy, it's kind of like, eh, eh. And this, this shows what pulls us in. It's the conflict. Who is the protagonist going up against? Even classics like The Wizard of Oz, they got the Wicked Witch of the West. So imagine even trying to watch a Marvel movie where there's no bad guy, where there's no conflict, where there's nothing that's happening that's going wrong. Like who wants to see that movie? I don't. It's not gonna engage us, it won't excite us, it's not gonna pull us in. And Disney knows this so well. You guys know the movie Finding Nemo. Literally has the conflict in the name, right? Like, oh no, Nemo's lost. We gotta find him, we gotta find Nemo. You got The Incredibles, they had Syndrome. Buzz Lightyear had Zerg. And have you ever noticed even when you have little kids sit down to watch a movie, you give them popcorn, do you have to teach your kid to sit down and watch a movie? No way. Like the kids are just locked in. They're zoned in. They automatically have this love for stories built into them. And Disney, they've capitalized on it. They've built a juggernaut of a company and listen to their mission statement. Part of their mission statement says this. The mission of the Walt Disney Company is to entertain, inform, and inspire people around the globe through the power of unparalleled storytelling. They've tapped into storytelling. Something that we all just automatically engage with as if understanding and interacting with stories was built into our DNA. And so what if, what if these fictional worlds that Disney and others have created are revealing something deeper within each of us? What if our inherent love for stories is actually pointing you and me to a greater story that we're living in right now? What if God was trying to use storytelling to communicate to us too? You see, if someone were to ask me about this book and just to describe it as simply as possible, I wouldn't say it's a story about God. Oh, did he just say that? I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's a story about how we should be living or there's rules about how we should be living, but I would first say that this is just a story. And I accidentally used story in the previous definition, but I would just first say that this is a story. I'm not trying to take God out of the description of the Bible because clearly he's all over these pages, but I'm more saying to emphasize it that this right here is one of the greatest stories that we will ever come across in our lives. And I wanna make the case that all the stories that we've grown to love and enjoy and the movies that we love, they're really pointing us to this one. They're really pointing us to this one. But we've come to doubt this. We've come to question this. We have thoughts like, you know what? This is old. This is thousands of years old. It's, it's outdated, it's irrelevant. And even when I try to read through this story, it makes zero sense to me. Like, I just don't get it. I don't get it. And seniors, you guys know how this goes, right? When you have that literature class and you have to reread that one story by Shakespeare and it's written in that like King James version where it's the thou shalt doeth and seeth and beeth and all this, you're like, what in the world is happening in this story? And so seniors, you do what any normal person would do. You pull out your phone, get up Safari, sparknotes.com. I need help with this story. I don't understand it. And all the English teachers are like, no, 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 read the story. Do not spark note it. But I'm telling you, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. And this morning, we are gonna need some help with this. So we're gonna spark note it. And you're gonna see up here on the screen, if we were to just see a big overview of this story, here's what it is. It's creation, it's fall, it's rescue, and it's restoration. You see this first one, we're all pretty familiar with it. God created the heavens. He created the earth. He spoke things into existence. The intricacies of gravity, the cycles of the seasons, the stars in the sky, and all the liveliness that we see in here, especially in a springtime season, God created it all. And really the pinnacle of this creation, he made you and he made made me. Unique from all other creation in that we were made in God's image. And basically what this means is that we have something in us that no other creation has, and it's this, you and I, we have a capacity to have a personal relationship with God. Trees don't have that. Our beloved puppies don't have that, but we do. We have this. And when God was finished with creation, he was like this, this is very good. You know, we can think of this as the traditional once upon a time, right? We kind of have this perfect beginning. We have this perfect start. Everything is happy. It's, it's without blemish. Everything's great, right? And as cool as it all sounds though, We're not exactly hooked yet on this story with the once upon a time, everything's great, right? We're not hooked. But that's when we get to this next major scene, the fall of man. And most of us have heard about this portion of the story too. 
And to quickly summarize it, it goes, Adam and Eve, they end up eating this fruit from the one tree that God did not intend for them to eat. And then that unique relationship that we were created to have between us and God, it was, it was broken. A brokenness that would be handed down from parents to their kids, to their kids, and to their kids. And we see bits of this scene play out in classics like Snow White, or even the more modern version, Enchanted. There's a reason why in our minds the bad fruit, which, what, is, what is the bad fruit? It's in apple. Yeah, and it's always an apple. We actually don't know what it was, but it's always an apple. And we remember it from these stories that we've grown to love. Like if the witch can just get this princess to eat the poisonous apple, she won't be the fairest of them all. Now, if this story was good, if this one was good, we should be hooked, right? There's this moment of conflict. Adam and Eve have messed up, but we're not quite there. Like something's missing. We're not quite hooked yet. And that's okay, because you see the fall that we normally always talk about, the Adam and Eve fall, there's actually another fall that happened before that. And that's where I want us to go to. And so we're gonna check it out. So Ezekiel 28, that's where we're gonna start. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip there. Hopefully you already did. And we're gonna be in verse 12. Halfway through verse 12 is where we're gonna start. And we read, about, we read about these unseen, invisible messengers who serve God in ways we don't fully know. And God gives us a glimpse of angels. And this is an account of a particular angel. So we read you talking about the angel. We're in verse 12 of chapter 28. You are the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God, and you walked among the fiery stones, and you were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created." Talk about swagger, right? Like, man, if you thought you came into church today with a cool watch, like this dude is blowing that out of the water. I just named a bunch of stones. I don't even know what half of these stones are, but they sound really cool. And then it's like, they're mounted in gold, right? This is, this is, a, this is a legit dude. Like we're talking probably one of the goats of all of the angels, and this was him. Like his beauty was unmatched. His splendor was undoubtedly profound. And other passages give him a name that means the morning star or, or light bringing one. And the name of this angel was, was Lucifer. You still not hooked? Okay, we, we can keep reading. We'll pick up where we left off. Because you are blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Interesting. Now we have a new conflict. Now we're not just sitting here with Adam and Eve screwed up in the garden. We have something different here. And you kind of got to give the guy props though, right? This is kind of like the Michael Jordan mentality. He's like, you know what? I'm not at the top. I need to be at the top. So he goes after that number one spot. And he's even trying to, to take God's spot. We can only guess that that's what the pride was that it talks about. You know, we don't get much detail on how this all went down. I sometimes like to picture, like, how would he have done this? Like, did he just go up to God on the throne and say, hey, 1v1 me. And God's like, huh? He's like, yeah, 1v1 me right now. Winner takes all. It's like, um, uh, okay, right? And so we get this idea of, it probably was a lot more intense than a basketball one-on-one -on -one or however you just pictured what I just said, but it ended with this angel being expelled. And he went from being known as Lucifer to being known as Satan or the enemy. And so began the struggle between good and evil, between God and this fallen angel who now he needed to come up with a different plan because his plan of taking God's place, it was no longer an option. So what could be the next best thing? What do you think was his play? You know, he could have just started causing havoc to the earth. He could have tried to kill animals, start fires, just ruin God's creation, but that just doesn't bite. It's, al it's almost too predictable. If you were in his shoes and taking out God was off limits, what would be your move? What would you do next? I'm sure it didn't take long for him to think, but, but what about the man and woman? What about those that he created in his image? What about the ones that God claims that he can have a relationship 
with. You know, Satan could have just ended us. He's clearly a lot more powerful than we are, but he didn't do that. No, what if he could get God's prized possession to willingly betray him on their own? That would sting. That would really hurt. Are you hooked yet? You see, when we come across stories and movies that have these betrayals or plot twists, the characters who are supposed to be good and they turned bad, we always have this pit in our stomach, right? Like, how can that person turn bad? Or you might be one of those people that are like, you know what? I knew he was bad the whole time. Saw that coming. Saw that coming. Yeah, that was me. I recently watched a movie and I didn't know what was happening, but the buddy that I was watching it with, he did. And so I turned to him pretty early on and I said, this dude's bad, right? I just said it straight up. And he kind of just doesn't, doesn't do anything, just emotionless. He doesn't want to give anything away. And then sure enough, I literally fall for this. I, midway through, I'm like, this guy's 100% good. And then boom, he's bad. And I'm like, what? I, I knew it, and then I didn't, and then he was, and my heart's just going all over the place. And this is the classic betrayal, right? We're going to have a few spoiler alerts here, but you know when Anakin Skywalker turns to the dark side? It's one of those. Or when Hans throws us all for a loop in Frozen. Who saw that one coming? Huh? Or when that little sweet lamb lady in Zootopia turns out to be the, the bad guy. Like, I didn't see that one coming either. And really, they're, they're all echoing back to this betrayal found in Genesis 3. And so take a look. Take a look with me. We're going to go to Genesis 3. And let's check out how Satan plays his cards. He plays them really well. Starting in verse one, here's what we read. Now the serpent, bad guy, Satan, this is him. He was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And notice the question he asks here. It isn't a question of, did God really say not to eat of just that one tree? No, no, no. He asked, did God really say you must not eat from any tree? And if we back it up, God literally just beforehand had said to Adam and Eve, Guys, you are free to eat of any tree here in this garden. God is a God of freedom. He's not a God of making rules. Yet too often we get caught up in the next part where it says, but you must not eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we're like, what? Why? Like, what's the big deal? What's wrong? For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, come to think of it, that kind of sounds like a decent reason to not eat the fruit. It almost sounds like God wants Adam and Eve to live and not to die. That's great. And so Satan, though, he's questioning God's motives by asking the wrong question. And he doesn't emphasize God's freedom. No, no, no. He emphasizes his restrictions. And how often do we find ourselves doing that same thing? Do we not find ourselves fixated on God's rules and forgetting the freedom that he offers? And so here's Eve's response in verse two. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And look at how quickly that freedom was just glanced over. Yeah, 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 we can eat of the trees, but you're right. That one, tree, he did say that one tree, you're right. And then she, she just adds a little something in there. Instead of, instead of when you eat it, you're gonna die. She goes, even if we touch it, we're gonna die. And whether she realized it or not, She's already mis, she's misusing what God had said and she's adding things on to what God had already said. And meanwhile, while Eve is just getting berated by the, the serpent here, Adam is just chilling, literally doing nothing, okay? So thank you for nothing, Adam, okay? We needed to, need to kind of just give him what his due is because Eve is just getting pounded right here, but Adam, he's there and he's just being a doofus. He's not helping in any way, and in any way, shape or form. So, Here's what the serpent says to Eve. Here's his response. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. The best manipulators will mix in some truth with a lie. And that's exactly what we see here. He's not wrong. He's not wrong what he says, except for the dying part. They really will have their eyes opened. They really will see good and evil for what they are. There's a lot of truths that are hiding that blatant lie, and it's all but game over for Adam and Eve. We keep reading. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was still standing there doing nothing, and he ate it. 
Mission accomplished. Betrayal's completed. Now Satan has officially gotten God's image bearers, you and me, to abandon the relationship that once was. And it's the ultimate stab in the back when taking God's place didn't work. So just to give a quick update on this story here, we are how many pages into this thing? We're like on page two. And this story is crazy, is it not? Like we have, we have all the things. We have that once upon a time. And then we have what we think is we're the ones who messed up, but really it was Satan, the one who first messed up. And then since he couldn't take God's spot, he's like, you know what? I got this incredible plan. I got this incredible plan and I'm gonna go after, I'm gonna go after God's prized possession, you and me. And so we've got this clear bad guy, good guy dilemma. We have this conflict and I hope it's hit you that you and I were in the center of this conflict. We're the ones that are at stake. We are the ones that the spiritual forces are at war over. But before we continue our Spark Notes overview of this story, I really want us to spend a little bit of time making us aware of how the enemy operates. Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament and he put it this way in 2 Corinthians 2. There's a section where he says, in order that Satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes. And if we're being honest with ourselves, and with how this story has unfolded so far, I, I think that we hardly ever really think about the enemy, let alone how he is scheming against us. So this morning, let's bring some things to light. Let's, let's just uh, like maybe open the opponent's playbook a little bit, right? There's a reason this is cheating in sports. You cannot go look at the opponent's playbook. You're gonna know exactly what they're doing. You can't do it, it's cheating. But this isn't sports and we're gonna cheat, okay? So we're gonna take a look at the enemy's playbook. We're gonna figure out what is going on. And so getting back to the story, we kind of wonder if eating the fruit is really what did it. If eating the fruit is what did it. Why didn't Adam and Eve, or why didn't Satan just get a normal fruit, hide the forbidden fruit in the normal fruit, and then get him to eat it that way? Like why did he go full on talking snake mode right in front of their faces? Why did he do that? It's because the enemy, he knows to go after our hearts and not just our actions. It's the first thing we see here. He knows to go after our hearts and not just our actions. See, what makes you as a parent more upset? What is gonna sting worse when your kid unknowingly does something wrong or when your kid knowingly does something wrong? You see, Satan's goal is much greater than getting Adam and Eve to eat the fruit it was to deceive them to their core so that they betrayed God from deep within and the action was just a result of what had already happened in their hearts. This proverb helps explain how significant this is when we read, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. We see what's at stake in this story. Good and evil are in an all out war for you, for your heart. We've been coming at this story from the devil's perspective for a reason because I think at times we can forget that we are in the midst of this battle and we can almost have this attitude that, you know, we're the ones that are outsmarting God. Lord, I know, I know what I want for my life. Yeah, God, I know you're real. I'm gonna give you my Sundays and then I can just take it from here or we just dismiss God altogether. And in the case that you thought that you were coming to those conclusions on your own, May this be a reminder that there is a powerful, powerful enemy who works 24 seven to draw you and me away from God. He doesn't just put in the eight to five, five days a week, he's constantly working. And first Peter describes it like this, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, you and I, we're not as autonomous as you may think. We're being pulled and influenced by spiritual powers way more than we realize. And in our Western culture, that is one of the greatest ways the enemy has worked, to get us to think about life as if it isn't spiritual. In other words, what you see is what is true. What you don't see, well, who really knows? Who really knows? We've recently been encouraging students to, to reach out and invite their friends to church. And we, we try to set them up for success. Like we do a lot of fun, fun activities. Just a couple of days ago, we did a flip-flop formal and we're like, hey guys, invite your friends, get them to come to this. They're gonna have a great time, right? And so one of these students decided to try to do this. And, and you know, it's not like we're inviting them to come sit quietly to a service and listen to a message for 30 minutes. Like that just sounds terrible, sounds terrible. <laughs> Oof. Last, last service, they didn't laugh at all. And I'm like, oh boy, we are. <laughs> We are in trouble. 
Everyone's off the train. Okay, so we're, we're, right, we're setting them up for success. And so the student invites their friend and what, what the friend does is they end up going to school day after day, morning after morning, and they wait at the front door of the school for this student to come by and they literally tell them God's not real. And they did it day after day. And they're just like, God's not real. God's not real. God's not real. And I'm like, you've gotta be kidding me. This is bananas. Like we're trying to just have some fun, do a pool party, whatever it is. And then they're just, they're just literally going on the offense against this person. And you can tell that that's a heart that has just been turned far from God. And although from that person's perspective, if God isn't real, then the devil can't really be real either. And this brings to light an interesting observation that I think we can make about Satan and it's that he doesn't really care about being worshiped. He doesn't really care about being worshiped. You know, you think the dude who wanted to take God's place, he would want all the glory, all the honor, right? All the power that he could get. But truthfully, before he turned against God, he would have been that. He would have been one of the most powerful, glorious creatures up in heaven and he, he was the angel. So if God's throne couldn't be touched, why even chase being worshiped? Instead, he spends his entire existence manipulating you and I to worship anything but God. Anything. He goes after our hearts so that we on our own will give glory and honor to whatever isn't God and that is his play. And so as we look around and we look around at the world, how's he doing with this? How's he doing? You know, it's easy to point the finger outward and notice all the ways that the world is falling into some of these patterns, but it's a lot harder for us to acknowledge it about ourselves. And if you haven't quite felt this yet, you were literally made to worship. You were made to worship. God knows this, but so does Satan. And deep down, we cannot help it but to worship something. And God created us in his image with worship being a primary way that we would connect to him. And so when the enemy gets a hold of our hearts and when sin is the default from the day we are born, our worship will always be misplaced. We will constantly be searching for something because deep down, our created wiring is screwed up. And the enemy's play to get us to willfully go against God, it was brilliant, it was brilliant. Though as strategic as Satan is, he's incredibly predictable. And I really want us to hone in on this because he uses the same strategy every single time. Satan uses the same strategy every single time. And here it is. It's literally spelled out for us in 1 John 2, where you read that for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, it is not from the Father, but it is from the world. See, these three methods, that is how Satan gets us. That's how he tempts us. That's his strategy time and time again. And there's an incredible message on this that goes into a lot more detail by Rick Warren um, that I would encourage all of you guys to listen to. It's, it's incredible. And he expounds on these three things in the following way. He describes the desires or the lust of the flesh. This is that temptation to feel. Like, man, I wanna feel something good, right? Can you relate to that? Or maybe this one, the desires or the lust of the eyes. The temptation to have. I mean, I just wanna have this new whatever, house, car, pool, whatever it may be. And then you have the pride of life. This is the temptation to be, right? This is where we want our kingdom to be built up. I want to be elevated in the eyes of other. I want my ego to go up. I want people to see me as, right? The pride of life, temptation to be. In the Adam and Eve portion of the story, look at how all three of these things are right here. They see that the fruit is good to eat, right? Tasty, the temptation to feel. It's pleasing to the eye, the temptation to have. And then Satan says, they will be like God, knowing good and evil. The temptation to be. They wanna be, they wanna be like God, why not? So Satan puts the full court press on them and they crumble. And here's where we get to the most depressing part of the whole story. Satan is greater than us. He's smarter than us. He knows our weaknesses. And we have no chance of saying no to what he has to offer. And so we're here in this story and we're fighting a losing battle. Even with this playbook right in front of our faces, good luck. Isn't this where so many stories bring us though, right? They bring us to this place where the bad guys are winning. They have the upper hand and we have no choice but to cheer for the underdog, to cheer for that one way out, to cheer for the hero, even if it seems slim. And a lot of times the hero and the bad guy, they end up meeting 
And they have this, they have this face off, right? This good versus evil, dark versus light. It's the Kylo Ren versus Rey. It's the epic battles in Lord of the Rings, the Avengers versus Thanos, Simba versus Scar. And we see this play out in this story too. Matthew chapter four, here we have the face off. Jesus, God in human form, he was led by the spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Good versus evil, here we go. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. I would assume so, that sounds terrible. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The lust of the flesh, the temptation to feel. Like who would not wanna eat after fasting for 40 days? I'd feel incredible. And Jesus responds with scripture and he says, no. So the devil's like, okay, you're responding with scripture. I'm gonna use scripture. So he takes him to the holy city and had him stands, he stands him on the highest point of the temple. And he says, Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, for it is written. See how he uses the Bible right here. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift, up in their, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. The pride of life, the temptation to be, if Jesus would have thrown himself down, all of a sudden these unseen angels would have just swooped in and saved Jesus from death and he just would have been lifted up and people would have been like, oh my goodness, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And Jesus responds to scripture and he says, no. So again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And he's like, all this I will give to you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. Satan is is getting one more chance at this and he's going back to where he started back in heaven and he's trying to take God's rightful place on the throne. And if Jesus would just bow down to him, then he'd have what he wanted back when he first started this whole thing. And he's tempting Jesus with the lust of the eyes, the temptation to have all these kingdoms and all the splendor of the world. And Jesus responds with scripture and he says, no, he says, no. So Satan flees. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, that... Why? Satan flees, that's not a face-off. That's a terrible face-off. All Jesus did was play defense three times in a row and he never played offense. Like, what kind of a face-off is this? We're like, we need something better. And so we kind of ask ourselves, well, what was the point of that? What, what is Jesus doing? And 1 John 3, 8 helps us answer this. And here's what it says. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work was to destroy the devil's work. You see in this story, destroying the bad guy wasn't gonna solve the issue. Getting rid of Satan, it wasn't gonna fix the problem of betrayal in our hearts, the bondage to sin that we were manipulated into. The work of Satan had to be done away with. And we find that Jesus, he didn't come down to earth to kill the enemy, but he came to rescue you and me. That's what he came to do. Do you ever wonder why sacrificial love does something in us? I have to be honest with you guys. Avengers Endgame. I may or may not have shed a tear slash had water forming in my eyes at a certain point in this movie. We're gonna have another spoiler alert, but hopefully all of you have seen this by now. And if you haven't, close your ears or plug your, whatever, plug your ears because I'm I'm spoiling this one because my favorite dude, Iron Man, and I know he's kind of arrogant, but he's my favorite. But to his core, he loved others. And how do we know this? Because Iron Man, not once, but twice, he was willing to lay down his life to save everybody else. And in the end, against Thanos, it did, it did cost him his life. It cost him his life. You see, in this battle that is going on for your heart and for my heart, in this story that we find ourselves in right now, which one gave himself up for you? Did Satan die for you or did Jesus? You see, if someone is willing to die for you, Do you ever have to question their love for you? Sacrificial love, it resonates within our hearts because that's exactly what Jesus did for you and for me. It's so messed up, but he let us beat him. He let us mock him. He let us ridicule him and hang him on a cross to eventually suffocate and die so that he could bear the penalty of betrayal that we deserve to pay. Jesus took your scarlet letter. He took your sin, he took your shortcomings and all of the hidden things that that you and I do in secret that we wanna keep hidden. He bore all of that and the weight of it all of our betrayal on the cross. And guys, this part of the story, it should blow our minds. It should blow our minds that Jesus became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That should blow our minds. 
And I don't know about you, but that motivates me. That story gets me excited. Like maybe today you've never really thought about the opposition. You've never really connected the dots that your hardened heart towards God isn't really the work of you, but it's the work of the enemy and it's the work of sin. And I hope that makes you squirm a little. Like I hope that makes you feel uncomfortable and I hope it causes you to not ignore this story anymore. You see, Jesus faced Satan and his temptations head on the same ones that you and I face every single day. And he won. Jesus died and he rose again so that his victory over sin and death could be given to you. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil once and for all so that you don't have to live in betrayal any longer. You don't have to live there. Jesus wants your heart back. There's a reason that he doesn't force any of us to love him because it wouldn't really be love. And it really wouldn't be from our heart. And so as we go from here this morning, I wanna encourage you with this. You have a role to play in this story. From those listening who are entering retirement, for the grandparents, to the parents, to the kindergartners, to those of you seniors who are in this room, you all have a role to play in this story. You see, Jesus, he lets us in on a little secret at the end of this whole story. And here's what we read. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new, everything new. And this doesn't at all give justice to the full effect of the restoration that will be coming. But Jesus is right now in the process of making all things new. And so this is the role that we get to have. We get to join him right now in bringing about the restoration of all things. And it starts with our own hearts. It starts right here. So maybe you've never thought about the fact that God has a very real enemy who is constantly trying to point us away from him. And and maybe hearing this big picture story, it really helped you understand the love that Jesus does have for you. And if that's the case, would you let him have your heart? Would you just believe in what he has done on your behalf and just welcome in his forgiveness Ask him to change you from the inside out and he will, he will. Some of you, you may feel inadequate. You know that you know Jesus, but man, life is just overwhelming. The struggle is real. And I'd encourage you just to verbalize those things to the Lord. Maybe confide in a trustworthy friend and know that you're not alone. And realize this, God isn't only using perfect people. Matter of fact, he he only uses messed up people. That's who he uses. If we go throughout this story, we could do a whole nother message on the murderers, the adulterers, the thieves, the liars that God used in incredible ways to be a part of his story. And so you have a role to play in this story. This story is still going today and we're in it right now and we have a role. So if you're still in this place of maybe questioning and pondering, maybe you do have some doubt still, that's a completely normal place to be. And we're not gonna act like we have it all figured out here. And I have questions and I always will have questions. It's good to have questions. A couple resources though I wanted to point us to would be the Jesus Storybook Bible, especially if you have kids, you gotta get that thing because it really pulls out how this whole book, it is a story. And your kids will start understanding from a young age, like, wow, this is the story of scripture. I get a, I get a part to play in this story. And then another one that's um, not, as, not as good for kids, but great for the rest of us, it would be a book called Epic by John Eldridge. It's really short, less than 100, 100 pages. And it will bring this to life. Like if this didn't bring the story to life, then read Epic, because it will bring this story to life. I just hope you guys know this morning that, that you're loved and seniors, wherever you are in here, we're gonna miss you guys. And I hope that you guys take this story with you. I wanna wrap up with reading this from from 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, verse 16 says this, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't made up, it wasn't made up. The story wasn't made up. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets that have been made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it 
as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And above all, get this, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This story is reliable, not because of man, but because of God. God's the one that has kept this. He's kept this story. He's written this story. And he has chased after you and me because he wants our hearts back. He wants our hearts back. And so, man, if he has your heart, you have a role to play in this story.